this is Viewpoint. And this is the last show of 2012. We take the shows, of course, a month in advance. It's November. We, we take, we, this show airs in December of 2012. I'll, I'll put it on the computer. I may put on the, I may wait to put it on the internet until December. We'll see what happens. We're just going to talk. You know, I don't interview people as much as I used to because I get tired of going, <laughs> getting the camera and the lights and it's a little, you know, a little cheap hundred twenty-five dollar camera and, and the lights and whatnot and and the cords and the little tripods and going over to somebody's house or going over somewhere and interview. There's a lot of people who would like to be on my show, but I just don't. I'm just old and I'm getting old and tired. I need to exercise more so I won't be as tired, <laughs> to a uh, tired to do the show. But we do it because it's just a passion. And something you would like to do, I really should take it to the next level. There's so many people on the internet. I would listen to NPR, Marketplace, Marketplace or American Public Radio, Marketplace Radio. Look up, look up, go on the internet and look, look for this uh, report if you can find it. And they were saying a lot of young 20 somethings are doing, they're making money and they're getting uh, famous and getting television deals off the internet. Because they had that little show, like, of course, I'm, I'm in the, what? I'm not in the most desirable range. I'm something's blinking on that camera. I don't know what's blinking. Okay, I'm also. It's, I'm not. I'm out of that 18 or 34 year old age group. Way out of it. So <laughs> I'm not marketable. You know, they market. You know, uh, 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 cheap cell phones and and like I haven't. I, I'm shocked I haven't had, got my AARP information in the mail yet. So I'm out of a certain demographic. And so I, I like I said. I, my, I mean, you may be in your 20s watching that. Watching me babble, which is rare. Because, I, you know, the advertisers and, and marketeers and all that kind of good stuff, you want a younger group because you want to reel them into your products and services while they're young so they can be customers for life. What I'm saying, there's people, young people on the Internet, just like old Mark Sams, but they're making money, they're getting famous off the inter Internet. So someone, if you were in your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, let's say 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s, you're like, man, maybe when time has passed me by, I'm not going to be rich and famous. But we do it anyway. Whether we become rich or famous off the internet like some of these young kids, they're doing a TV show, they're getting a million hits, and they're getting uh, television deals off the, off the internet, doing these little simple shows like this off the internet. And some people are doing more advanced programming off the internet. Because nowadays with the, with the equipment, you can, with these, these cameras are amazing. If you invest in, I got a cheap camera. You invest in a good camera, and you invest in good lighting, it's, you know, it may cost you a few thousand dollars, it may cost you five thousand, it may cost you ten thousand, it may cost you a thousand. You could really do some some decent productions, and uh, you can make a little money on the inter internet, and it may go to the next level, where, where you actually get a real TV deal, real movie deal. It could happen. I mean, but I'm saying at my age, you say, well, it, could it really happen? I may talk about belief in the later part of the show. I really should I should actually go get a watch. I love. Like I said, when I do the show, I just like, I, I worked late last night and I, I said, man, I feel like doing the show, but the deadline is like tomorrow, so I got to do the show because the deadline is tomorrow. So now I'm really tired, I said, let me get up here and do the show. So I left everything down, said, I don't even know what my watch is and all that, my clock to fucking time this thing. But we'll move on. Let's move on. I wanted to open up the show to talk about the, what I talk about every week is being in an African American neighborhood, being African American and and uh, all that because I live often near not far from the Dan Ryan Expressway here in the Chicago and the South Side of Chicago. And those of you who've been to Chicago know Chicago's racially segregated. And in many parts of Chicago is racially not all of it, but many parts of Chicago racially segregated. The the races all the races and the classes all really sort of meet on the borderlines. But on, on the far south side where I live, everybody's pretty much working class, working class to poor. And it's mainly African American. You have some Latino, mainly Mexican, on the edges of some of these neighborhoods, but not where I'm at. Not within about a five mile radius from where I am. So I'm just totally an African American neighborhood. And that's a whole nother ball game because, you know, 2013 next year, be here before you know it, will be the 300th year of the Willie Lynch speech. And the Willie Lynch speech is, you know, go go online and look up Willie Lynch. Go online and look up Willie Lynch. The Woody Lynch speech, the Woody Lynch letter, and you know people say it's fictitious. I don't care if it's fictitious. I don't care if it's a, it's a made-up story. We don't really know who made it up, but it's so poignant. In 300 years, and they, and Woody Lynch said the Woody Lynch speech, uh, the effects of the Woody Lynch speech may last 300 years, or maybe forever. 
be perpetual forever. And the basic tenets of the Willie Lynch speech was what? It's divide and conquer. Divide and conquer works all the time. He said, you know, he used the old you know, terminology. He said you pitch, if you will, pitch the old slaves against the young slaves and the dark-skinned slaves against the light-skinned slaves and the men slaves against the female slaves and they'll fight each other. Not in that order. It doesn't have to be in that order. It be in any order. But you pitch the old slaves against the young slaves, the dark-skinned slaves against the light-skinned slaves. And the female slaves against the and the men slaves. Female men versus female, female versus men. You you have them fight amongst each other and quabble and quibble, and they'll do this for three hundred years to this very day. See, Mark Sims on. The, I should go get. A, I should go back in the kitchen behind the wall over here. I'm in the bedroom. I should go go and uh, back in the house over here in the, in the kitchen, only a few feet away, and get a brown paper bag to show you that. Now, here's one right here. No, here's a brown paper bag right here. Some stuff. Let me go over here. So, I was just looking past the camera. Man, see, that's why, you know, sometimes you don't need a script. You know what you're going to say. You just start talking and stuff start happening. You know, if I, if I only believe, you know what I'm saying? You got to believe. Here it is. The brown paper bag. So basically, you know, depending on what that brown paper bag you got, I'm basically lighter than the brown paper bag. Now, when I was young, remember, most most human beings get darker as they get older for a lot of different reasons. They get darker as they get older. I was a, a lighter skinned person when I was uh, when I was a kid. I was a high yellow Negro, high yellow Negro when I was a kid on the other side of the brown paper bag. So if you're on the other side of the brown paper bag, something depending on like you were like in the South and the Orleans, you wouldn't consider really black. And of course I can't dance or sing, so you're not really black. You know, I don't go to soul food restaurants, I don't go to church, so you're not Mark, you're not really black. Because to be black, you gotta be ignorant. You gotta be able to sing and dance. You gotta be able to rap. You have to go to the soul food restaurants, hang out with your peeps. You know what I'm saying? Be a player, be a pimp, be a hustler. Then you're really black. <laughs> I was born in 1962, and I love telling y'all every, every every show. I, when I was born in 1962, my Mount Sinai Hospital on the West Side, I was born a Negro. That's on my birth certificate. We were black when I was a kid in grammar school. Now we African American. But then again, there's a lot of folks who say, you know, I ain't really black, I ain't really African American, I'm all of the above because when you do my DNA, I have a mixture of African and European blood and, and maybe some Asian, I don't know where that Asian came from, so what am I? I'm not really black, I'm not really... It's all, I mean, remember, remember, race is a social construct and it was constructed to divide and conquer. Getting back to the Willie Lynch speech, getting back to my, what I talk about every week, Clean neighborhoods, safe neighborhoods with excellent schools. Living out here on the Dan Ryan, near the Dan Ryan Expressway on the far south side of Chicago. So the point is that why can't we have, I've always wanted this, and I know the answer, but I'm only one person, and it needs to, and a movement needs to be created to, to an experiment is very, it's, it's this. Can poor people, because poor people in general, and especially poor African Americans, because we're special than the other poor people in America because... We're fighting against the light-skinned slaves, the dark-skinned slaves, the female slaves against the men slaves, and the old against the young slaves. Because we're basically still slaves, only 150 years from slavery. Remember, they had house Negroes and field Negroes 150 years ago, 20 years ago, 300 years ago in slavery, right? Those dynamics are still with us. So they have, we have, we have modern-day house slaves, modern-day field, field Negroes, modern-day runaway slaves. If you want to extrapolate, you know, the modern times and to the, from the old slavery days. So how can you, so it's harder for African Americans, poor African Americans, working class African Americans to end this crime and drama. On the south side, the west side of Chicago and other parts, a lot of the drama is due to divide and conquer. A lot of it is just pure poverty, a lack of values, and also density. Density. Sometimes where poor African Americans live, in the suburbs or in the hinterlands, some of us do live in the hinterlands, but if you move us out in the suburbs and the hinterlands, spread us out, there's not as much crime because it's not as dense. In the city, there's more crimes in cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, because poor black people on top of each other is dense. And over time, if you spread out the density, you spread us all out, we'll still commit crime, but not to the degree and not, to the, uh, and not as bad as we do it now. So density is a huge problem. I'm not a demographer. I'm not a social scientist. I'm not a college professor. I'm just running my mouth based off of what I heard off of talk radio and national public radio. Okay.
Okay. And WVON Radio. That's the, the WVON University. WVON is the African American talk show in this town. So most of the things, most of the things I babble about is what I, you know, hear on these radio stations, and of course, real life meeting people and, and, and observing things. So the point is that can poor African Americans have safe, clean neighborhoods with excellent schools? Now people say, Mark, you're not the one, brother. You just too. You got the complexion for the connection. You're not black enough to lead this movement. You can't do it. And I understand that because, you know, it's just like when Adam Clayton Powell was doing his thing out in Tammany Hall, out there in Harlem, out there in New York. That was a different era. A brother that could pass for white was one of our strongest voices, if not the strongest voices, back in the day. Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. Let me say it again. Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. Before my time. A brother that could pass for white, but he was one of the strongest voices. But that was a different era. I mean, it's more modern era. Well, when, uh, back in the day, if you had one drop, you were black, you were uh, a Negro, you were colored. And, we, and because of segregation, we had to live amongst each other. Now we don't have to live amongst each other. I know black folks, and I don't blame them, they live 20, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles away from the inner city, from the hood where your peeps live. And I don't blame them. Because if you got any sense, you really don't want to raise, like I said, I raised my, my, my teenagers in the hood with your peeps, with my peeps, <laughs> because I'm cheap. I got a raggedy house that's paid for, and the raggedy house on the south side of Chicago is paid for is going to allow me to send my children to college. I'm not going to spend that five, six hundred dollars a month to go buy a Chrysler 300 or a Lexus or something. I'm going to spend that, I'm going to keep my raggedy car in my raggedy house and take that five, six hundred, seven dollars a month or more, sometimes more, it's, it's gonna basically going to come out to like $1,000 a month to send my children to, to college, which sounds crazy because that $12,000 a year, $10,000 a year, I could do something else with, or we could start our own business, we can open a subway shop or maybe a, a Dunkin' Donuts or something, we can go take that $10,000 a month and do an entrepreneurial venture, we can go buy some buildings, it's a lot of things we can do. But I chose to send the kids to college. That's a, I, should get, I should get and talk about building wealth. Man, I was going to take a break, but why should I? I'm on a roll. The spirit is moving me to do this show because I sure didn't want to <laughs> didn't, didn't do the show. But what, I love talking. That's my gift. And once I get to roll, I get to roll. So let, roll, let, me, let me go back to that wealth in a second. So let me go back to the original thought. Clean neighborhoods, safe neighborhoods with excellent schools. And that comes down to building a movement where you instill values. Forget about jobs first. If you, got, and, and, and if you have a value... If you were taught a work ethic, you could find a job. Like me, like folks, they mad at the Latinos. And Chicago's mainly Mexican, right? Especially on the South Side. I'm not too many Puerto Ricans and Hondurans and people from whatever, Central America. It's mainly Mexican. I don't have no problem with them. In these neighborhoods I live in, we took over these neighborhoods 40, 50 years ago. When white folks used to live here 50 years ago, they've been gone. They've been gone for 50 years. But African Americans moved into these neighborhoods. Most of us moved from the South. And we moved in these neighborhoods, and, and, and 50, 60 years ago, and, and the neighborhood I live in, these house, this house was built 50 years ago, brand new house, 50 years ago, when black folks were moving in this section. So here we are. So a lot of us are moving out of Chicago. We're moving out of the inner city. We're moving out of the big cities. I, it's okay. It's just a natural migration. You move to the city. You move to the suburbs. You move to the country. I mean, or you, or you stay in the suburbs. You move from a poor suburb to an affluent suburb. You move to a... A poor part of the city to an affluent part of the city or whatever, you know. Some of us, like me, just, hey, we, 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 we choose to be stuck here for a lot of different reasons. It's all right. It's all good. But the foundation is raising your children with some freaking sense. 